So you've ever felt like you've been, you're being watched? You ever have that experience where you're doing something and you just get this sense that there are some eyes on you and then maybe you look up and realize that your senses are right, someone's staring at you? You ever had this experience? It happened to me one time when I was uh, building a doghouse in our backyard in Boston. I uh, was getting the lumber ready, and I kind of had this little sense that people were looking at me, but, you know, I kind of kept pressing on. But then I was kind of hammering away at this thing, and I really felt like some eyes were on me. When I looked up, I found that it was so. The, the boy next door was just peering over the fence, and he was kind of watching me. I said hello, and, you know, he kind of gave this subtle wave. And I said, oh, are you hoping to learn how to build the doghouse? And... He just shook his head no, and we kind of stared at each other for a minute. I thought he was going to say more, and I finally said, well, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm just waiting to see what a pastor says when he hits his thumb with a hammer. <clears throat> Actually, that story is not entirely true. Uh, it is true that I was being watched by my neighbors often in Boston in the same way that I'm watched by my neighbors here in Bellevue. Uh, it's just... I took a little artistic license in kind of creating a story to illustrate a point. Uh, first of all, I didn't have a yard in Boston. That's because no one has a yard in Boston, not in the middle of the city. Secondly, uh, I didn't have a dog, mostly because we didn't have a yard. And thirdly, I didn't build a doghouse because I cannot build a doghouse. I can do demolition all day long, but I cannot do construction at all. So you have to forgive me for, for kind of creating the story to illustrate the point. But while the story isn't exactly true, the point that it illustrates is. And that is... We are often being watched. And not just Christian pastors, I'm talking about Christian people. What I'm saying is, you are being watched. People are watching you to see what you will do. Well, little things like what happens when you hit your thumb with a hammer. Or perhaps more importantly, what you do around big things. Like the issues of our world that everyone is looking to see where there might be some hope in the midst of it. You are being watched. So says a Christian pastor named Peter. And if you'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 in your Bible or on your mobile device, I'll show you what I mean. Now, I call Peter a, a pastor, but it, it, as you know, way back in chapter 1, Peter introduces himself in this letter as an apostle of Jesus Christ. It's just that here in chapter 3, Peter outs himself as a pastor because Peter does something that pastors are notorious for. At least every other pastor is notorious for this, not this pastor. Peter says, finally, which makes you think he's about to land the plane. Only he doesn't land the plane. Peter circles the runway, not just once, but twice. Peter goes on for two more chapters. And actually, that's not entirely true. First of all, I do this as well. Every pastor does it, myself included. Secondly, when Peter says, finally, he actually isn't wrapping up the, the book, the letter of 1 Peter. He's wrapping up a section in 1 Peter where he's been talking about the specific things that we're called to do as followers of Jesus. And finally, or thirdly, that is, Peter outs himself as a pastor by doing something very pastoral. And that is, he summarizes a whole lot of things into one main point. And that one main point is this, that you and I are to live questionable lives, in a good way that is. Here are these words from 1 Peter chapter 3, starting with verse 8. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult for insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you, your good behavior in Christ, may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. 
After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels and authorities and power in submission to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there's a whole lot going on in this passage, but I'm going to try to do something pastoral and try to summarize it into the main point. And the main point of this passage is really the main point of this section that Peter's been talking about for the last couple of weeks. The main point is that we are to live lives that bear witness to Jesus. Way back in chapter 2, verse 12, Peter explicitly says that we are to live good lives that point to the goodness of Jesus. And here in chapter 3, verse 15, he, says, he follows that up by saying we are to live faithful lives that provoke questions about Jesus. He says, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. That's what I mean by the fact that Peter says that we are to live questionable lives. And we're to do so by first revering Christ. And the word revere here in this passage, in Greek, it, it means to sanctify or to set apart. What Peter is saying is, is we are to declare that Jesus is Lord and we are actually to live accordingly. That we should follow him faithfully in our lives every day. And I do mean every day because the tense of the word revere there in Greek speaks to this continual action. That we are to continually to seek Jesus, to continually follow Jesus so that people will eventually ask questions. And people will ask questions because when you follow Jesus, you will start to stand out. P people will ask, why, why do you do that? Or why are you like that? How are you so weird or hopeful? And if you're wondering why Peter would assume that people would ask questions if we follow Jesus, it's because Jesus, by his very self, his, his life provoked questions. Everything that he did caused people to ask, what's going on here? What do you mean by that? Why are you like that? Again, Peter says that if we will continually follow Jesus, people will eventually ask us questions. And so we should always be prepared to give an answer. And I looked up the word always in Greek, and do you know what it means? It means always. <laughs> we're always to be prepared for this because it means we're to always be trying to live like Jesus. Of course, that's the challenge, right? That we don't always live like Jesus. And in fact, Peter knew this. You know, earlier I said that Peter introduced himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter, though, could have also introduced himself as the apostle who betrayed Jesus. If you know the story, Peter is the one who said, Jesus, I'm with you to the very end. Everyone else may run away, but I will be with you to the very end. And then what does Peter go ahead and do after that? Old Testament saints who are waiting for heaven to be opened up. Still other people think that, that Peter is saying that Jesus preached the gospel uh, through Noah to people in Noah's day because the word after actually isn't there in the Greek text. Verse 19 literally says in the Greek, Jesus was made alive in whom he preached the gospel to imprisoned spirits. Now, I'll be honest with you, I would love to spend all morning discussing all of these theories with you. I love geeking out over confusing and confident thing, or controversial things in the Bible. But I'm going to make a pastoral decision and we're going to avoid the debate this morning. Because those theories and the story really isn't the point. The point is what Peter is trying to illustrate via this story. And the point is that we are called to preach the gospel. Whether Jesus went to preach in hell, whether he ushered people in the presence of God, whether he preached the gospel through one of his servants, a man named Noah, the point remains the same, that the gospel is in view. And it's actually what these theories all have in common. Peter is saying that we are to live lives like Noah that provoke questions about the goodness of God. We're to live our lives in such a way that people want to know about Jesus' victory over death. And, and they want to know about the promise of the kingdom of heaven. And, and they want to believe that God actually can cleanse our hearts and consciousness of all sin. We're to live lives that, ask questions, that provoke questions about that. 
So again, think about the story of Noah and how this worked. Do you know how long Noah was on the ark? One year. Do you know how long it took Noah to build the ark? 120 years. Now, I know that 120 years makes this sound like a made-up story, and you know what? There are some theories about this, and if you're really curious about talking about those theories, come see me later. We will geek out of there together. But right now, don't get lost in this. Again, the point that is being illustrated is that for 120 years, Noah was doing something pretty odd. Can you imagine the questions that were raised? Like, um, Noah, why are you building a boat? Don't you know that this is a desert? Don't you know that it hasn't rained in years or decades or a century? I mean, you can imagine the questions and maybe some of the jabs, right? In fact, you don't have to imagine them. You can read them in the book of Genesis. There are a lot of questions that would be raised by this. And Peter isn't suggesting that we do strange, impractical things. The ark is actually very practical. It is strange, no doubt, but it's practical. It's how God rescued Noah and his family. Peter's not saying go do odd and practical, you know, uh, odd and practical things. Go do a bunch of stunts to get people to ask you questions. No, Peter is actually calling us to do strange, practical things. Strange in the sense that these are things that we all long for, but we don't often see in the world. Like what, you ask? Like being like-minded. Being like-minded is pretty hard to find these days, isn't it? Have you noticed this? How polarized everything is, how politicized everything is, how people on both sides seem to be throwing stones at each other. Peter says, go do something strange and practical. Be like-minded. Doesn't mean you have to agree on every issue, but it means you agree in purpose. That who we follow transcends all things. And because we follow Jesus together, we can love each other. We can support each other. We can help each other revere Christ. We can be sympathetic towards one another and compassionate. We can actually invest in one another and get to know each other, to get below the surface of the how are you's and I'm fine to actually know one another deeply. And beyond that, we can begin to expand our social circles, to extend hospitality, to share resources, to even embrace suffering, which again, is a pretty odd thing. To willingly surrender our rights, to embrace suffering without developing a persecution complex. To be opposed, not for being too self-serving, but for being too self-giving. For being strange, for being so compassionate, and so humble, and so kind, and known for building more bridges than walls, known for serving the community without throwing stones at anyone. Peter says that we can provoke questions by doing those very things. Of course, I think if we're going to be honest with ourselves... We probably have to admit that that's not the picture that the world is often seeing, is it? Unfortunately, I think the world at the present time is more often than not seeing a caricature of the community that Christ died for, rather than this good and beautiful community that God is making us to be by Christ. Can we change that? Well, Peter says, yeah, we can. You can't control what everyone else does, but you and I can absolutely control what we do. And he says that we can actually begin to change this by learning to return evil evil for blessing. By learning to return insult with peace. By learning to do the things that we're called to do in Psalm 34. And that's what Peter quotes in, in in verses 10 through 12. To do what is right even when we are wronged. Can you imagine why the world might ask some questions if they saw people who collectively did that? If they saw a a group of people who, who loved each other in spite of some pretty diverse differences. If they saw a place where everyone had a sense of belonging, where everyone uh, was, was treated with dignity and respect rather than as a commodity or an enemy. Can you imagine how the world might rally around that? How the world might long to be a part of that? Well, guess what? You don't have to imagine it because it actually happened. It happened in Rome of all places. Despite the fact that Roman emperors like Nero were ruthlessly trying to stamp out the early church, the early church grew exponentially. Now, it doesn't mean there wasn't hardship. In fact, we, we can't gloss over the fact that the early church experienced 
un unbelievable hardships. Many people lost their lives at the hand of the Roman Empire. In fact, some estimates say as many as a million Christians died in the first three centuries of the church's existence. And yet Rome couldn't stamp the church out. In fact, the fact that we're here today is, is living proof of that. But you know what? It was happening even shortly after the days of Peter. In fact, about a hundred years after Peter wrote his letter known as 1 Peter, a church leader named Tertullian wrote a letter where he tells us about this very thing. About a hundred years later, he says that Rome was so disturbed by this growing movement in, in this thing called the church that they couldn't figure out what was going on. They couldn't figure out why Christians weren't like everyone else. They weren't per participating in these raucous parties that make Las Vegas seem like Sunday school. They couldn't figure out why, despite their best efforts, to kill them, to burn them, to hang them on crosses, the, churches was, the church was growing exponentially. And so do you know what the church did, or the, the, the Roman Empire did? They sent some spies to church. Tertullian says that Rome actually sent some of their own people into church. They dressed up like Christians. They showed up on Sunday like Christians. They sang songs with the Christians to try to figure out what was going on. Here's what Tertullian says these spies reported to the Roman Empire. These Christians are very strange people. They meet together in an empty room to worship. They do not have an image. They speak of one of, by the name of Jesus who is absent, but whom they seem to be expecting at any time. And my, how they love him. And how they love one another. When was the last time someone said some words like that about us? Or has anyone ever said any words like that about us? When was the last time someone said some words like that about you? H has anyone said any words like that about you? A and has, ha have you experienced this where people ask you questions about Jesus because they see something in you? You know, as I was thinking about this, I, I could think of some specific examples, but, you know, they tended to be when I went on a mission trip, you know, where I was swinging a hammer, not doing construction, obviously, demolition. But you know, these intentional times where you get away and you're, you're, you're living purposely, uh, purposefully, I, I've seen it happen there. But I had to back up from that and ask, well, what happens outside of that one week where I go someone else to do this? What about my everyday life? And you know, I'm not sure that I could speak to many examples where people have said things like that about me or asked questions like the questions that Peter is talking about. So I've been asking myself some questions lately. Perhaps you should do the same. You know, if no one ever asks you any questions about your life, you might want to ask some questions about your life. Like, what needs to change? Is it my actions? Is it my attitude? Is it my acquaintances? You know, my social circle? Let me say that again. If no one ever asks you any questions about your life, you might want to ask some questions about your life. Is there something that needs to change? My actions, my attitudes... My attitude or my acquaintances. You know, some of us may need to change our actions. That is, we may to intentionally need to do things that put us in a position to serve others. To actively give, to actively uh, show empathy and compassion and service. You know, things like Kenneth was talking about with debtors for good. Of course, some of us are serving and we hate it. And everyone can tell. Do you know people like this? People who do nice things that, who aren't nice about it? You know, people are like, well, this is what Christians got to do. I'm just going to show up and serve. <laughs> Some of us may need to change our attitude that, no, actually, this is a great privilege to walk in the steps of Jesus and to give of ourselves. Of course, there are some of us who are serving with glad and sincere hearts. The problem is we don't know a single non-Christian. We've either been Christians so long or we've been so siloed off in our Christian churches and our Christian schools and our Christian homes that we don't really interact with many people outside of the church or outside of the faith. Some of us may need to change our acquaintances, that is, to expand our social circles, which may just mean opening our eyes to the people that God has around us every day, or it may actually mean putting ourselves in a position where we begin to meet people outside of the church and outside of the faith. You know, as I've been asking questions for myself, I'm thinking, what needs to change? The answer for me, honestly, is all of the above. I, I, and part of this is just being new here, but part of it is just learning to revere Christ every day. 
that I want to put myself in a position to serve others. And so I've been trying to do that on a daily basis and trying to be aware of those around me. And, you know, I'm getting connected with places like Jubilee Reach because I want to serve and be active in that. At the same time, too, I've been trying to change my attitude because, you know what, I'm pretty busy and also I'm kind of self-centered and I don't always want to put other people first. Long story short, I've been having to ask God to show up in the midst of this and to bring change in my life, which actually is the point. That we would revere Christ and He would begin to work through us. Of course, at the same time, I've been trying to expand my social circle and change my acquaintances. Not that I don't want to get to know you. I am absolutely trying to get to know you. It's just that I can easily get holed up within the walls of the church and fail to meet the neighbors around me. So I've been trying to get to know my neighbors, and I've been doing things like I've been attending some of the AA meetings here in our building because I've been trying to get to know folks. I also joined this weird outdoor men's group, which you'll see some of them pictured here. I'm not going to tell you everything about this group because I'm going to tell you about this next week, including the fact that they gave me a nickname. So a few weeks ago, some of you shared your nicknames with me. I will be glad to share mine, but you got to come back next week. The point is, I, I've been putting myself in a position to meet people out of my normal social circles, not because any of these people here or downstairs at AA are a project or a target, but because they're actually genuine people who are made in the image of God that I want to get to know and I long for friendships with. And of course, in that friendship, I would hope to have spiritual conversations, but those will come by the leading of the Spirit and perhaps an awareness of the way that God is at work. Now look, what I just described this morning is descriptive of my life. It does not have to be prescriptive of yours. I can't tell you what needs to change in your life. All I can do is invite you to be open to what God says may need to change in your life. I want to simply invite you this morning to ask some questions. How are you revering Christ as Lord? Where is He showing up in your everyday life? What kind of questions are people asking you? How are you answering them? And if people aren't asking your, you any questions, well, asking them, what might need to change? How might I revere Christ as Lord in my everyday life? You know, if you and I can answer those questions honestly and hopefully with the work of the Spirit, if you and I can collectively follow through on that, Imagine what God might do. Imagine what God might say about his gathered people in this body that we know as Bellevue Christian Reformed Church. Can you imagine it? Would you pray for it? Will you join me in committing ourselves to it? For the sake of our community and for the glory of our Lord Jesus.